I'm sure that unless you live somewhere beyond complete communication this week, you've heard of the death of Robin Williams, learned of his hanging himself and thus a suicide. I was looking online, and I have a few places I go just to find out what people are saying and thinking, and I found this article. I think you'll find that part of it is true to the divine volume, the Bible. And yet part of it will not be. Let me read this to you. Robin Williams' suicide, as is every suicide, is a tragically sad thing. My heart hurts to think what Williams' inner life must have been like at the end to drive him to such a terrible decision. My heart aches for those he's left behind, his wife, his children, loved ones, and friends. His death has left a hole in their lives that nothing and no one can fill. In the wake of his suicide, billboards and media pundits alike have been assuming that Robin Williams is now in heaven, making God laugh along with other funny men who left this earth before their time. So, is he? There's one thing we know and one thing we do not know that can help us think clearly about Robin Williams' eternal destiny. The one thing we do know is that access to the presence of God and life in the age to come is reserved exclusively for those who have placed their eternal trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. There is nothing remotely ambiguous about that statement. All roads may lead to Rome, but only one leads to eternal life. The only door that leads to life is the narrow gate that Christ himself has opened. As Peter puts it, there is salvation in no one else, and I don't know what version he's using, for there is none other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. The world will naturally stiffen their necks when they hear these words and throw epithets at those who verbalize it. But their argument is not with us. It is with Jesus himself. He is the one who said it. And we simply agree with him. Now, William's desperately sad ending arouses our sympathy, as it should. But we must not confuse our sympathy with God's salvation. There is one and one path only to eternal life. And that path has not been altered by so much as one centimeter in 2,000 years. That's what we know. Now, all of that, as far as I can tell, is in complete harmony with the teaching of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, listen closely with the rest of it. The one thing we do not know is whether Robin Williams did business with God in his dying moments. While his mother was a Christian scientist, and he puts in parenthesis a counterfeit form of religion which is neither Christian nor scientific, his father was an Episcopalian. So it is certainly possible that Williams heard the gospel in his formative years and may have remembered it all his life. The thief on the cross did not place his faith in Christ until he was drawing his final breath. His last words were, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In response, Jesus' last words to him were, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 22, 42 through 43. It takes but one moment, one whispered, even agonizing or agonized prayer to pass from eternal death to eternal life. No one but the thief in Christ knew that this transaction had been made. The thief's wife and children didn't know. I don't know how he knew about that part of his family. And it's unlikely that any of the onlookers heard this private exchange. As far as everyone knew, this man died as he lived, a sinful, unrepentant, and broken man. Yet we know better now, and one day we will be where he is with Jesus in paradise. Will we see Robin Williams there? We don't know. Only two men know the answer to that question. But we who are yet living know how we can find our place in God's kingdom. Whether we experience eternal life or eternal death is not God's choice, but ours. 
To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, the last words to be spoken are, Thy will be done. Either we will say it to God or God will say it to us. So the pressing question is not where Robin Williams will spend eternity. The question is, where will you? Well, certainly that is, is a good question, and it's true. But the part that I want to deal with is his example of just how and when a person is saved from his sins by Jesus Christ. And you see immediately that he begins to talk about the thief on the cross. Well, that being the case, let's study about what the Bible truly has to say concerning the salvation of the thief on the cross. And is that an example for people to follow today as to how and when they are saved by Jesus Christ? Now notice he indicated that there was a prayer that you could pray because he likens the prayer, the statement, or the, the comment of the thief on the cross to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom as a prayer for salvation. Well, if you look round about you, and you've all heard of this, you'll know there is basically what is called the sinner's prayer. Now, it varies. There is no set amount of words, or neither is it said the same way, but that's what people think because they think you are saved today as the thief will say. Now, I have one that I found that is a so-called sinner's prayer that a denominational preacher said you can pray if you're outside of Christ, lost in your sins, and destined to a devil's hell. Here's what he says you can pray. Father in heaven, I have sinned and am in need of forgiveness. I come to you without merit of my own and ask for the pardon you offer since Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are other prayers that would vary somewhat, but it all comes down to saying, I can't save myself. I know I'm lost. It's my fault. I confess it. Jesus is the only Savior. Father, uh, I accept Jesus. Please save me. And they all hearken back then to the thief on the cross as their pattern for being saved. If you go over to Luke chapter 23, you will notice that here is in the midst, as was read this morning, in fact, early on before the Lord's Supper, uh, we read this and saw what was happening to a degree in Luke's account of the events around the cross. And when we come down to verse 42, reading from the King James Version, and he said unto Jesus, that's the thief, Lord, remember me when thou can comest into thy kingdom. Well, that's, that's certainly good, but uh, where did he learn the Lord had a kingdom? This ought to begin to tell us about something about this man. And I'll tell you why I raised that question. You know that John the baptizer was sent to prepare the Jewish people for the coming Messiah who was Jesus Christ. If you look in Matthew chapter 3, the scripture reads, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he uh, goes back and talks about that he was uh, preaching in the spirit of Isaiah and so on. Then you come down to verse 5 of Matthew 3. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. Now Mark chapter 1 and verse 4 tells us that John's baptism for the Jews in order for them to get ready to receive the Messiah was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The Jews preached to, we're not living like the law of Moses said. John was saying, correct that, repent of your sins of not living like the law of Moses said, for it's still in force for the Jews as to the way that they approach God, that is, under the law of Moses. They were then to believe the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, there can't be a kingdom without a king, so the king had to be at hand if there's going to be a kingdom at hand. Thus, he's preaching the Messiah. He would say later, when he saw Jesus coming to his baptism, to those standing round about, he would declare, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so it is that John was preparing the Jewish people 
for the ministry of Jesus Christ in the flesh on this earth. And to do that, they had to repent and turn back to living like the law said, believe the message that the kingdom and the Messiah was at hand, and be immersed in water to obtain the remission or forgiveness of their sins. And they would be ready for the Messiah. That's in God's plan for the Jews to receive Jesus when he began his earthly ministry. Now, I know then where this thief, or at least I have good grounds for understanding it, that either had heard John preach, or he had heard some who heard John preach, or possibly had heard even the disciples of the Lord in their limited commission to preach to the Jews the same message of John. And thus, while he earlier, and if you read the passages earlier in uh, Luke 23, that he and the other thief had mocked the Lord as those were doing round about him, and had railed upon him. But this thief repented, and that's good. Everybody ought to have a heart like the thief to repent and turn from whatever sins they're doing. But how did he know to say to the Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? Well, we've already seen how he would know. It had been preached in all of Judea and Jerusalem and the whole area. It says all, twice, all, nobody left out, had gone out. And they were baptized of him. They heard the message. And this man therefore would have heard of the kingdom that Christ preached and the kingdom that was his. And so in his dying misery, he repents. And he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And our Lord responds, verily, truly, it's a fact. I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now that sounds pretty much like salvation to me. Because there's only two places you can go when you die. As a saved man into the joys of paradise or into the part of the Hadean world that is Tartarus, the place of punishment where the rich man went in Luke 16 that the Lord talked about. Well, he says, our Lord does, that you're going to be with me in paradise. So that's all well and good. There's things to follow here. There's things to understand. But there's something that gets missed by the denominational people in the forming of just how a man can be saved. And that is they do not understand, for whatever reason, I don't know, but they do not understand the teaching of the Bible when it comes to the right division of the Word of God, the handling right. They make no distinction in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They do not recognize that there was a father rule period for a time on this earth known as the patriarchal age in which God dealt with all men. And it's covered from Genesis 1 verse 1 down to the giving of the law of Moses by Moses on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel in Exodus 19 and 20. They do not realize that the law of Moses was given specifically to the Jewish people. Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 5, Moses said to the Jews after they had received that law, that that law was not given to our fathers, but was given to us, even us, who are all of us alive here this very day. Now it's true Gentiles could decide to follow the law, be proselyted to it, and live under the law, that's true. But specifically the law was given to the Jews. Now when we come on over to the New Testament, hey, you know, there must be a reason that they call it Old Testament and New Testament. And why do you call anything old and then call something else of the same kind new? You might think about that. Words have meanings. But when we come over to the New Testament, whose New Testament? The New Testament of Jesus Christ. The Testament is a will. It's a manifestation of the will, in this case the New Testament of Christ, a revealing of the will of Jesus Christ. Now mind you, Jesus is about to die, but he's not dead yet at the time this conversation takes place between him and the thief on their respective crosses. He's still alive. And mark this down. When Jesus walked this world, earth and flesh just like us, as a son of God, he still had power to forgive sins. And listen to me. While he lived on this earth, his testament's not in force. We'll see more about that later. 
He could forgive sins however he wanted to forgive sins. Now let that sink in. When he walked this earth, he could forgive a man's sins, sins the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. He could forgive man's sins any way he saw fit to do so. That was his business. Now you know, this may sound rather ridiculous, but a lot of stipulations in the will of men it can seem ridiculous. But if you respect their will after they're dead and gone, and they have a last will and testament, then you abide by their will manifest in that written document. And you'd understand that if they said, you'll receive $10,000 a week from the rest of your life from this estate if you will mow your yard twice a week. First time in the first part of the week, you will mow your yard beginning in the front yard and going to the back. And the second time you mow it the latter part of the week, you'll start in the back and go to the front. Well, why does he want me to do that? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mowed his yard when he was alive. He told me just to mow it any time I wanted to mow it, any way I wanted to mow it. And I think then that that's just the way I keep doing it because that's what he did. That's what he said. But the man's dead now. Well, how do people who are dead still exercise their will on this earth? A last will and testament. We all know that. Now, what is this second part of the Bible? It's a testament. It's a covenant. It's the revelation of the will of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want to know what He wants you to do, you have to go to His will. He's sitting right now at the right hand of God and has been since the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts 2, when He established the church. And His will is set down in His last will and testament. Now listen to this, and I think it will be helpful to us when it comes to these things. The writer of Hebrews is dealing with Jews who are Christians. They once lived under that law. They believed and obeyed the gospel. Now they're under the law of Christ. But due to great persecution, they're actually thinking about leaving the New Testament system, the New Testament authority, and going back under the law of Christ. So the writer of Hebrews is explaining to them the design and purpose of the law of Moses and the design and purpose of the New Testament of Christ. One did what God expected it to do. The other one does what God expects it to do. You can't be a Christian and live under the law of Moses. Now watch. In that he saith, verse 13 of chapter 8, in that he saith a new covenant. He had made the first old. Old Testament, New Testament. Nobody just sat down and arbitrarily said Old Testament and New Testament. They took it out of the scriptures. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is ready, or now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Then he begins to explain these things. And tells about the teaching of the law of Moses and the order of worship and such things. And you get on over into chapter 9 and verse 15. Now listen. And for this cause... He is, Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now listen. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now listen to the next verse. For a testament is a force after, after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Could the language be clearer? Now if you say, this is the word of God. Well, could the word of God be clearer on the right division of the word and the difference of the Old Testament and New Testament? Clearly, the writer of Hebrews is pointing out and establishing and emphasizing that after Christ died, we don't follow his teaching while he yet walked this earth as to how he forgave sins, but we go to his last will and testament. 
and read what he said one must believe and do in order to be freed from sin. Now back to the thief on the cross. Was Christ dead yet? Well, no, he wasn't. So what do we find from verse 17 of Hebrews 9? For a testament is a force after men are dead. Is his New Testament in force yet? No. Why? He's still alive. And the scripture says for a testament is a force after, after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Is the testator still alive when he talks to the thief on the cross? Yes. So he can save him any way he chooses to save him. And yet there is good evidence that this man heard about the kingdom through the preaching of John who came to get the Jews ready to receive the Messiah. For he asked, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That question is based upon former knowledge. Knowledge that he had to learn somewhere. And since John and Jesus and the disciples preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the kingdom has to have a king, he must have thought somewhere or the other through proper education that Jesus was that king and he was going to establish his kingdom even though he was dying on that cross and will be dead before the thief was dead. And so the Lord forgave him according to his will. But his will was manifested while he was alive. But now what about his will after he's dead? Well, the testament is a force. His testament is a force after he's dead. So, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you have the record of the life of Christ in the flesh on this earth. But you have also the death of Christ. You have the resurrection of Christ. And you have the ascension of Christ to heaven. And on that first Pentecost, following the resurrection and ascension of Christ... Peter stands up with the eleven moved by the Holy Spirit and declares plainly for those who are lost in their sins that you must, as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by the authority of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, for unto in order to the remission of forgiveness of your sins. Now imagine some of those Jews because he had charged them with the death of Christ, ye have taken him with wicked hands of crucified and slain, the Son of God. Now imagine if some of them says, I don't have to be baptized. I was there. I heard that thief when he asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. I heard what Jesus said to him. Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. So I'm going to obey Jesus in the same way the thief did. Why couldn't every Jew had said that on the day of Pentecost? These are devout Jews gathered from every nation under heaven. They are loyal to what they know is God's will for them. That's the reason they're there keeping that feast day which the law required of them. They're determined to be what's right as far as they knew the right. And lo and behold, they learned things have changed and are changing that they now can't be saved because they are a fleshly descendant of Abraham and loyal to the law of Moses now they know that that Messiah that they read of in such passages is in books of Isaiah Isaiah 53 that tells of the suffering Messiah suffering for our part now they know this Jesus was not a false upstart because it's declared by Peter as well as the other apostles that evidence has been given, incontrovertible evidence, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah. Now they got the message because verse 37 of Acts 2 says, and they were pricked in their heart. Their conscience hurt them because they knew they had done wrong and it was their fault. Well, when they cried out to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The Lord's dead now. His testament is in effect. The ambassadors of the court of heaven moved by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to infallibly state the will of Jesus Christ as he had promised that he would do in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Now declares to believers... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Brethren, can't you see that you can't appeal to the thief on the cross? I can look back in this nation 
And if you go so far back, you can say they were good, solid citizens, even people who were solid in the government in serving this nation. And they didn't pay any income tax. So, I won't pay any either. If they, being sound and solid patriots and dedicated citizens of the United States, even serving in the government of the United States, didn't pay any income tax, then it must be that I don't have to pay any income tax. There's just a little problem with that. The laws have changed. <laughs> the laws have changed. And what do we learn in reading about this account of the thief on the cross? Number one, Christ could forgive sins any way he wanted to. If you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, you'll see that he did. He's still alive, though he is dying and near death, when the thief says, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And he says, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He's still alive. We learn from the writer of Hebrews that for a testament is, is, is not in force until after men are dead. Has no strength at all. But now he's dead. The apostles stand up to preach, being moved by the Holy Spirit, and they declare the will of He who sits upon the throne. And to believers, they must repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You can appeal to the thief on the cross all you want to. But it's not the will of Jesus our Savior is set out in the words of His last will and testament because it came into force after He died. And it had no force whatsoever before He died. That's why that we beg and plead with people to follow what Paul said to the young preacher Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. And people aren't doing that when they say, you can be saved today like the thief on the cross. Now it's true, as I said in the first part of this article I read, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. That's right. But if they really believe the implications of John 14, 6, then they would believe the will and testament of Christ where He manifests His will. What is the way of Christ to the Father? What is the truth of Christ to the Father in His last will and testament? How does one obtain spiritual life through the Christ? The only way you can get it. By the words of his New Testament. Now remember John 12, 48. Jesus, while he walked this earth, said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now that was said when he walked this earth. Well, if he wanted to forgive men their sins any way he chose, and he did, what if he said you must do thus and so to be saved while he walked this earth? But they wouldn't do it. Would they be saved? Well, now he's dead and gone, and the Bible teaches his will is the New Testament. And now he says one must believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of their sins, Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And complete your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. More than that, He does not bind upon you in order to become a Christian. Less than that, and you cannot become a Christian. It takes all of the steps in the plan of salvation for one to gain the remission or forgiveness of sins. And so it is those on the day of Pentecost, having heard the word, for faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10, 17, had faith in Christ as the Messiah, the Savior, formed. As believers, when they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? If it had been like most people today, their preachers would have said nothing. Because they teach if you try to do anything in order to be saved, you're trying to earn your own salvation. So there's not a thing in the world for you to do. Just ask Jesus to come to your heart and it's all right. I've never really appreciated that very much because I always thought if I asked Jesus to come to my heart, that's me doing something. So they even meet themselves coming back on their own doctrine. 
But that's not what the Holy Spirit through the apostles told those believers on the day of Pentecost. As believers in Christ, which shows it wasn't belief alone that saved them, they were commanded to repent. That's a resolve of the heart to turn away from every evil thing you've ever done. And from now on, follow the teaching of Christ. Let me ask you this. Where were they going to find the teaching of Christ? Well, you'll find after they obeyed the gospel, Acts 2 and verse 38, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Why? Because they knew the Holy Spirit was revealing the mind of Christ through the apostles. And that's what we have, the apostles and New Testament prophets. They wrote the New Testament. Whose New Testament? Whose last will and testament? Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, you must abide in my words. They'll judge you the last day. So I know already that Jesus will stand true to his word. And I know what he says, when I must believe that Christ is the Son of God, then I must believe that Christ is the Son of God. When I must repent of all my sins, then I must repent of all my sins. It's imperative. Paul said in Acts 17, 30, and the time that this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Well, that's pretty plain. But then I must confess my faith in Christ, Matthew 10 and 32 and Romans 10, 10. That's confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm not ashamed of it. May get me in trouble to stand up before men, certainly did in those days, and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But it's a step in the plan of salvation. It's a step toward forgiveness of sins. The believer doesn't have it yet. The one that's repented doesn't have it yet. And the one that's confessed his faith in Christ doesn't have it yet. But every step, he's coming closer. Now, what's the final act? You're baptized for unto in order to something. It's the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. No wonder Jesus said in the Great Commission... When he commissioned the apostles to preach, and they were to preach it after he was dead, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Well, see, you just got to believe and be saved because he didn't say, he that believeth and is not and is baptized not. He didn't say that. Well, of course not. If you don't believe in him, why are you going to be baptized? Because baptism is obeying his commandments. So you don't have to do anything but fail to believe in him as the Son of God. You won't do anything else. Because all of that's predicated upon your belief that he is the son of God. In keeping the rest of the commandments and the great plan of salvation. But more than that. Paul wrote to the Galatians. Reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians. And said in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That it was by faith that they were baptized. I-N-T-O. Into Christ. And no other way you can get in Christ. No other way but to be baptized into Christ. And thus we understand why they were told then to be baptized for the remission of sins. And when Philip was preaching Christ to the Ethiopian eunuch, that's all the scripture says he preached. But that stands for the whole gospel system and the requirements of the gospel system for anybody to be saved by Christ. I know that because of the next statements in Acts 8. They came into a certain water. This was after Christ was preached to him. And he said, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, the thief on the cross. <laughs> that's what some people have said. The thief on the cross. I'll be saved like him. Well, that's not what Philip preached to him. Because the testament is now in effect as Christ sits and rules over his kingdom at the right hand of God. And so the man knew the urgency of baptism. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. He said, I believe that Christ is the Son of God. And they stopped that chariot. Both of them went down in the water. Philip baptized him. They came up out of the water. And lo and behold, the man went on his way rejoicing. Why would he rejoice? His sins were remitted. When were his sins remitted? When he heard that Christ was a Savior. But not just that. It's when he completed his baptism into Christ, having believed in him, repented of his sins, and confessed his faith in him. And that's when they went down in the water. Why did they have to go down in the water? Because he had to bury him in baptism. Colossians 2 and verse 12 and Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's why that Paul reminded the Romans of when they became Christians to exhort them to be faithful. In verses 17 and 18 of Romans 6, he said the like figure, or rather, uh, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine or teaching, which was delivered to you. Now do you know what Philip preached to the eunuch? 
Which was delivered to you? Delivered by the teaching of the gospel. God's power to save. Romans 1.16 And so it is that the thief on the cross was saved by Christ. No doubt about it. Because Christ could forgive sins any way he wanted to while he was alive. But once he's dead, the testament, his last one in testament, the New Testament is in force. And men must learn the plan of salvation set out in his last will and testament. Believing that Christ is the Son of God. Repenting of their sins. Confessing their faith in Christ the Son of God. And being immersed in water. Buried with him in baptism. Into Christ for the remission of sin. There is no other way. Now back to this little article. Yes, Christ is the way, but his way is set out in his last will and testament. And we must follow it. If a person, Robin Williams or anybody else, you, me, or Joe Blow, will not receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls and which word teaches us the great plan of salvation, we will not go to heaven. To believe in Jesus is to believe in his power to save and to trust his word. And Jesus said plainly, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you're not a Christian, we've taught you in the time we've had the truth of God's will concerning the testament, the will of Christ today. It'll face us at the judgment. It won't change. Can we say when we get there that we humbly obeyed him and lived his life, the life of faithfulness as a Christian in his church? For when you obey the gospel, he will add you to his church, Acts 2, verse 47. And there you're faithful to him until your life's over or the world ends first. If as a child of God you've sinned, we urge you to repent. We urge you to turn from those things in God's second law of pardon. We'll pray with you and for you, and God will forgive you. The problem is not in God's forgiving. It's our meeting His terms of salvation. And that takes humility to receive the truth and renounce any error. Even the error that says today you can be saved like the thief was. You cannot. If you're subject to the call of Christ, we invite you to come. While we stand and sing.